welcome everyone. So this is our fourth session of TSAP's Lectures and Planning Series. So today we have the pleasure to welcome four speaker panelists to discuss the entire national rules recently passed by the TLC Commission, the impact of women for higher services on the city's traditional for higher sector, and more broadly, the need for smart, really driven policy making in the economy. So first I'd like to introduce our moderator. Um, Alex Rosenla is a technology entrepreneur and she is the author of Google and how algorithms are rewriting the rules of work from the University of California Press. Um, now I can over to her. So please join me in welcoming um, Alex. Thank you. I'm not an entrepreneur actually, I'm an ethnographer, which is like the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ethnographer is critique systems and op entrepreneurs are optimistic about them. <laughs> um, so we're here today to discuss an earnings standard for New York City's app-based drivers, the Taxi and Limousine Commission's proposed new rules. And with us today we have Commissioner Mira Josh, Josh Shee. Sorry. Um, I'm going to only give short parts of everyone's bios to save time for questions and such, but you can see them all on the website for this event. Um, Commissioner Joshi oversees the largest private for hire ground transportation industry in the United States, and she is a vocal advocate for the value of robust transportation data that brings policymakers and citizens together, and under her tenure, the agency has become a public sector leader in the open data movement. We also have, to my right, Professor Anthony Banke, who is an assistant professor in urban planning at Columbia, focusing on the use of data-centric practices in city making, and his own research considers the use of digital data and pervasive sensing technologies in designing, planning, and evaluating urban environments, and spans the disciplines of urban design, urban technologies, innovation studies, and public health. And to my left, we have research scholar Eric Goldwyn, who is at the NYU Urban Expansion Program at the Marin Institute, and his dissertation examined transportation planning and policy formation in New York through the lens of Brooklyn's dollar vans. We're going to start with Commissioner Joshi, who's going to present on the most recent work that TLC has accomplished with the wage earning standard. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'll start out with a, a blatant pitch for public service, and the TLC especially. Um, we're always looking for people that are interested in city planning since um, together, the TLC licensed vehicles move about a million people a day. Their daily travels have a lot to do with how, um, or if, are greatly affected by how our city is planned. So I'm done, but there. <laughs> um, so TLC regulates all for hire transportation in, in New York City. That's yellow taxis, green taxis, Uber, Lyft, the dollar vans, which are now $2 vans, ambulettes, limousines, your local car service, your luxury black car service. All told, it's about 140,000 vehicles driven by about 200,000 drivers. Um, what really had the, you know, what really pushed those numbers up is the app services. When they came to New York City in probably 2014 is when they started to become a, a greater um, actor. 2014, 20, late 2013, you found more and more drivers coming into this sector, more passengers um, or more people in New York interested in taking for hire service because now they associated it with something they just pressed their phone. It wasn't like calling your local car base and, and waiting for five, ten minutes. That's what mine always says, five, ten minutes, but it's true. Um, and and so, the, so the sort of number of trips grew, the income opportunities grew, and by the thousand, we were seeing cars and drivers join the fleet. So that's about 3,000 drivers a month and about 2,000 cars a month, and that was steady from 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, so doesn't, you know, there's some mitigation because people leave or, or they give up driving, but overall the increase was um, monumental. 
And what had started out as a tale of, this is great, I have flexibility, I don't have to deal with the garage, the you know, sort of Danny DeVito picture of you know, the guy in the cage yelling that you're not gonna get the car you want. That's a thing of the past. You can now just get paid immediately, work when you wanna work, use your own car. It has to be licensed and passed by us, uh, you know, pass our inspection, carry insurance. No other jurisdiction has the same requirements we have in the U.S., but still you have this freedom. And it brought a lot of people in the industry and a lot of sort of happy driver advocates at first. Um, so around 2015, um, we started to get some initial trip data, which um, demonstrated to us pretty clearly that the bulk of these trips weren't happening as advertised in transit deserts or in the outer boroughs. Um, the overwhelming majority of them, 70 to 75 percent, and we're talking, you know, middle 2015, are happening right in the core in Manhattan, where we already have buses and taxis and a million other ways to get around. Um, and so we raised this, the 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 thought to um, city council and city hall: maybe it's time to start you know, clamping down on this endless licensing that we're doing because it's compounding an existing congestion problem. And at that time, um, some of you probably remember all the press that, that went ar along with this. Um, one of the biggest sources of pushback um, came from Uber, but not always in the voice of Uber. It came in the voice of drivers who they had given t-shirts to and convinced that if this thing went through, the, their days of you know milk and honey would be over. They wouldn't be able to earn the way they're earning, and this was going to be you know the end of of their you know newfound income opportunity. Um, and there were many drivers that that believed that. And I think the day you know we we had some days where we had driver protests right in front of our building. Um, there there's a whole other side where Uber attacked the politics, but there was this real groundswell of drivers. Um, if you fast forward to 2018, when we um, successfully passed rules that dictate minimum driver pay, what you see that's changed dramatically is drivers are no longer of the belief that they're, you know, hit the jackpot. They're very much aware that they're not making very much money at all. And in those three intervening years where there were no limits didn't result in them making more money, it resulted them in them making less and less year over year. Um, so we, in 2016, 2017, required the companies to give us driver pay information, uh, did a tremendous amount of analysis of that, determined that 96% of the app drivers make less than a minimum wage, the state equivalent, which is now $15. And we went on to devise a formula whereby you're, you're um, guaranteed a certain amount per minute, a certain amount per mile, and each company must keep you busy every hour. If they can't keep you busy, they're going to have to pay you more per minute and per mile. Um, and those rules became um, TLC law on February 1st, and the first uh, I was just sharing with Alex is, you know, you don't get a lot of compliments in this business, but the fact that we're getting very few complaints and some compliments to, um, in fact, is to me a sign that this was um, a huge need among the working population, and that's, you know, at least 80,000 people we're talking about that live and work in New York City. Um, and it was done in a way that I think um, responds to the fact that they're not employee employees, so you don't have the ability to just require their employer to, to um, pay them more. Right now, um, as soon as they w became law, you know, Lyft and Juno sued us, so there was some back and forth, and in the beginning, Lyft did not pay them the amounts that they were due. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from the drivers, and ultimately Lyft decided, although they'll continue their lawsuit, they will pay the drivers what they're due. I leave it to you to decide how effective that strategy is going to be in the end, but there you have it. Um, and Uber on Friday sued to overturn the cap 
um, which was put into, uh, because I forgot to tell you. So 2015, there was no cap put in place. 2018, by August, City Council revisited the issue with the benefit of a lot more trip data, which showed that congestion was getting worse, traffic speeds were getting worse, um, and there certainly was a correlation between empty Ubers and Lyfts wandering around the uh, congestion zone and the slowing traffic speeds. So in August 2018, um, the council did what they didn't do in 2015 and they put a pause on licensing. So right now we're not issuing any more licenses. Um, and on Friday, Uber filed a lawsuit to overturn that local law. And we'll see how that progresses, um, but you know that this is part of this is part of policy making. Um, there's the the numbers and the policy, and then there's the politics and the litigation. So we're at the end here, the litigation part. Um, but I'm really happy to to be here and that people are interested in this process. Um, and welcome all of your questions. Thank Thanks. you so much. Um, I'll just respond very briefly. So. I have been doing research on Uber and Lyft drivers and how they experience their work from about 2014 until uh, the beginning of 2018, not just in New York City, but across more than 25 cities in the United States and Canada. And so what's been really unique to see in New York is, this, is the political will that has come to bear on improving the living conditions and working conditions of drivers, where Uber and Lyft built off of a pre-existing and very strong taxi industry. And so a lot of taxi drivers would convert over to Uber and Lyft and Juno and Via and Get. Um, there was a merge at one point. And they had a very different sensibility of what it would mean to drive for Uber and Lyft in New York, where most drivers, majority of them, were, were working full time to pay, the, to pay their bills, to support their families, and this was their occupation. Whereas drivers in many other cities don't perceive Uber and Lyft as their occupation. They might also be working as a social worker, or they might be working as a nurse, or they might have some other primary identity as workers, but they consider this an additional uh, source of income that has often been narrated as supplemental like play money, like the way that women's work is often <laughs> categorically assessed as something that's not crucial to household stability. But in fact, this money is being used to pay really significant bills. It's your medical bills, it's rent, uh, it's college tuition for your kid. It's not true for everyone. There, are a, there is a tier of hobbyists who work for Uber and Lyft recreationally because they enjoy the social benefits, but they too are also affected by conditions that drivers widely perceive as unfair, such as when Uber and Lyft experiment on their pay without notifying them that they're running experiments on their pay. So New York City has been really, I think, a model for cities across the United States and in Canada that are looking to see how they can regulate uh, technology companies of which Uber has come to symbolize because Uber typically symbolizes both the gig economy, but it's also a framing device for how entrepreneurial regulators can intervene in the growing dominance of technology institutions as there's a growing social recognition of their political effects and rather than the sort of cultural narrative that sees technology companies as merrily glue, sort of hidden invisible infrastructure to how we, for services that we all benefit from in our everyday lives. Um, the TLC also has regulatory power that a lot of other cities just don't have in place. And I think a lot of cities are watching to see how New York City can create a sort of minimum uh, wage for drivers because they're also looking at how they can benefit from the services that a lot of their consumers and constituents uh, love and enjoy their very popular services, but at the same time, you know, there's a disruption happening to how this work gets done. And I think most recently, the taxi driver suicides in New York City really, really catal catalyzed a political will and recognition broadly in society that the stakes have shifted. This was no longer just sort of an opportunity for flexible work, this was something else. Um, that was going to bear down on how we all consider and conceive of workplace practices in everyday life. My work has also taken me to see that the practices that Uber and Lyft bear on managing drivers as a workforce have been changing our conception of work. Uh, 
Commissioner Joshi mentioned that, of course, drivers are not considered employees, and so the city has come in to create other standards <laughs> in lieu of that. But a lot of battles around how drivers are treated have been crystallizing around labor misclassification lawsuits. Um, what I've seen in my work is that drivers, although they are narrated as entrepreneurs and classified as independent contractors, have a boss. It's just an algorithmic one that encodes the rules of how they have to behave you know, through automated workflows and communications. And so there's, on one angle, there's the misclassification lawsuits that's helping to determine the future of how we conceive of work and what it means to work for an app and a boss. And we also have a sort of different regulatory purviews, including what the TLC has purview over, which is, okay, well, how can we use our existing laws and our existing powers and even creating new legislative authorities to try and create better working conditions, even as those larger looming labor lawsuits <laughs> take place in other areas. Um, the, the last comment I would make very briefly is that there are many regulatory agencies trying to grapple with the effects of Uber and Lyft overall uh, because they're so disruptive, because they come in and say, you know, we're not a transportation company, we're a technology company. And so the rules that you have in place for taxi companies and transportation companies no longer apply. The Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't apply to us because we are a technology company. And so we might make the, we might do the virtue signaling and say that we also provide accessible services or we're going to serve underserved neighborhoods, but it's not encoded <laughs> in their practices. It is considered a, an extra thing they might do even though it's not required. And so what's happened is kind of a split. And that split has become very visible in New York City because the medallion system was effectively broken, um, where there was no longer sort of the same kinds of caps that would apply to tax companies. The medallion system is still in place, but of course Uber and Lyft came and sort of flooded the market with many, many new vehicles, vehicles as well. Um, and so when we think about what New York City is doing, it's good to keep in mind that it's a model for how you can try and collect the data you need to assess how drivers are actually being paid. In many jurisdictions, cities don't even have basic data on where TNCs are operating. They don't have zip code data. And so that's been a fundamentally different and powerful approach to try and, 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 to try and assess the impact of these services. But more broadly, there's like numerous policymakers that are trying to figure out the right tools to bear on a model that is seen as quite disruptive, and that changes the framework for even approaching the problem. So if you're not a, tech, a transportation company and you're a technology company, you know, what does that mean for how the rules apply? Next, I think I'm going to turn it over to Anthony, who will respond with some comments. Cool. So I have four points um, of different scales and types, so I apologize it'll be a little bit scattered. The first thing that I want to say was actually my appreciation for the thought that went into the living wage aspect. Numbers are contentious, and I actually argue against a $15 minimum wage in New York, not because it's too high, I think it's actually too low. Um, and some estimates from the press say this wage could actually be as high as $17 for a driver. Again, that's contentious. Just to put into perspective, the living wage calculator out of MIT calculates that for a single individual household, the living wage is about $17.50. So even the minimum wage laws that have just been enacted are not actually enough to, to sustain a single individual household, let alone if you have children. So I think the thought, at least from what the, the press is evaluating of this, this regulation, is actually probably a better model um, for what the city should be thinking about, at least when it comes to the welfare of individuals, um, when it comes to their income. For me, you know, I was saying earlier to, to, to some of the panelists that I've been a longtime user of these services, that according to my Lyft profile, my first ride was 2013 April uh, in Boston when you used to sit in the front and you fist pump, which I learned they can't do because it confuses of whether they're uh, employees or not. <laughs> but, but I think for me, and I think for many people, the reason why these were popular compared to traditional taxi systems, if some of you can think back that far is how the relationship between information has changed. That for a long time, a lot of taxi companies, or I wouldn't say the companies, but the drivers, benefited from the asymmetry of information that we had. They know the routes, they know what the fares are, and they know whether the credit card machine actually works or not. 
And I remember many times back then, I would take a taxi in New York, and lo and behold, there's always a post-it note on the credit card machine where it's broken. Because, I mean, a lot of it is that they weren't paid every day. They might need that money. There's a lot of reasons. I'm not going to say it's unjustified that that, that happens. And when these apps came along, all of a sudden, you knew the fare. You presumably knew the route that you were taking. And now, if you compare that to a taxi driver, actually, I'll, I'll make it even more concrete. I was in Bangkok, and I was going to take a taxi. I could try to ask them, I don't know Thai, of like how much a fare would cost. They can make up any number that they want. I could also just pull up Grab, which is a competitor, and say, well, this estimates that the fare is this much. So if the delta is four times, then I know that you know, they're trying to maybe rip me off as a tourist from the United States. You know. And as these apps have come into play, that symmetry relationship, that, 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 that asymmetry has disappeared, at least with those companies, for the consumer. That you can begin to see this. And the regulations have now really pushed kind of a greater symmetry of information with the taxi drivers and the consumer. What I think was interestingly highlighted by this, this uh, new wage law is, although there's in some ways more symmetry with you, the consumer, there was not the symmetry with the driver, that they're being tested upon. They don't know how much they're gonna make per ride. They just see a number and that this is a fare. And that's not necessarily what they're gonna get paid because there might be discounts that are added later that they didn't know. So I think that what this is doing is it's highlighting the role of regulation and actually breaking open this black box that Alex, Alex was meshing about. But I think as we move forward with these technologies, there's still a lot of black boxes, right? That how surge happens, when, how much does it happen by, is still somewhat a black box. The routing is still somewhat a black box. So how do we begin to appreciate the benefits of the technology, but make sure that in a way that all the parties involved are benefiting and not just the kind of computer systems hidden in Silicon Valley? And how do we, as a consumer benefit, as a community benefit, but also the drivers? My last point with that, last part about the community, is that there's still a lot of questions as we grapple with these conversations of, of congestion. And this is not just in the purview of the TLC, so I'll say, but how do we think about the relationship of the built environment, our other transportation policies, the MTA and all of their kind of conversations that they're having, and thinking about a holistic transportation system that actually remedies some of these aspects. You know, is congestion pricing the silver bullet? Is fixing the MTA with unlimited money the silver bullet? I don't know, but deadheading is partially a result of labor dynamics, the services, but it's also the physical environment as well. We don't manage curbs, you know, in this city. So how do we have a larger holistic conversation as these services are just becoming more and more pervasive and more part of our everyday life? Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Well, um, so my name is Eric, and the first thing I'll just say is, as someone who studies transport, who's always been interested in transportation since I was a kid, um, the advent of Uber has really made my hobbies and interests much more popular. I assume you feel the same way as being the commissioner of the TLC. If anyone here can name a previous commissioner of the TLC, I'd be very impressed. Um, uh, but I think there are sort of two major things that have, that have happened that I think are very exciting. And one is getting to Professor Vanke's point about just sort of overall surface transport policy in New York. It's something that doesn't exist, and as far as I'm aware, has really never existed in this city. Other cities do a much better job of sort of coordinating between public transport, taxis, parking, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean. In the English-speaking world, London is sort of the, the, the prime example. And I don't know if, if you think that sort of your job is made much harder because you don't have control over all these different things. Um, the other piece of this I do think is the labor piece. And one of the things that I think is very underappreciated is what is the nature of driving as a profession? Is it a profession? Um, I think if you look at the history of yellow taxi drivers, you know, I'm going to list some names here, but Larry David, uh, <laughs> Michael Powell, the columnist for the New York Times, um, many professors, uh, many medical students, many people have been part-time taxi drivers sort of in the 60s, 70s, and 80s as a way to entering into a different profession. The average life of a cab, of, of a cab driver was very short. Um, I don't think I saw this number of the most recent TLC fact book, but I remember looking at it, I don't know, four or five years ago, and I think the average uh, 
lifespan, meaning the time someone was a driver was about nine years. Was that right? Yeah, no, there's drivers tend to be older and stay right. in the profession for a longer time. Yeah, yeah. right. And so it's like, I think it's like nine years, and I think the average age of a yellow cab driver is like between 40 and 50. Yes. You know, it's, um, it's the dynamics of it are very different from someone who's like, this is a stepping stone to some other thing. Um, and if that's the case, I do think then we do really need to think about sort of what are the sort of um, the way that we sort of you know pay these people and what are the benefits that are associated with this job. Um, I think that transition has totally sort of destabilized the industry uh, starting in sort of the late 70s um, and it's sort of come to a head with uh, you know the apps and one piece of data that I've never seen from any of these companies is sort of what is the churn rate of their drivers. How often... 68% for Uber drivers after six months, and it's a little higher for women. 68% continue or drop out? They drop out after six after months. After six months. Okay. Which makes sense why they're suing you um, <laughs> over wanting to, to have to have more, more people. It might be lower in New York. It was a, not, a, not specific to New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it costs a little bit more to yeah. start up. The barrier to entry yeah. in New York is yeah. very different, which is partially why you get so many full-time drivers. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to do it part-time. Mm -hmm. Right, No, I th and I think that, that's a great point. And the other sort of piece of all this that, that I found interesting, I was looking through uh, all the data the, over the past couple of days, and the thing that sort of blew me away, and there are reasonable explanations for this, is well, if you were to assume, what vehicle do you think does more rides per day? An Uber, Lyft, or a yellow taxi? Take Someone a take a guess. Someone take a guess. How many people think yellow taxi? How Thank many you. people think yellow Thank you taxi? For leading. How okay. many people think Uber or Lyft? Right. Oh, well, you tell us. I, I don't know who the majority was. No, no, but you, you just tell us. Oh, the majority was with Uber and Lyft. Okay. Right. Um, yellow taxi. There's more time. trips a day. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and there, there are some, I think, reasonable explanations for this. But I think one of the promises of all this technology was that there would be greater efficiency and that at the end of the day, these vehicles would essentially be perpetual motion machines with people filtering in and out. And, you know, it was like the Jetsons or I don't, I don't know, some other futuristic thing. Um, and I think that that bill of goods and that future sort of has not come to be. Uh, for the time being. And as a result, cities, policymakers, planners, and so on, really need to think hard about, okay, what are our objectives? What is good transport policy? But what is just good sort of social human policy? Um, and I think that, you know, those are sort of some of the things that we're seeing coming out of the TLC that, that is very interesting and, and makes New York unique compared to other jurisdictions. Anyhow, that's, that's all I got. I wanted to add just one or two last points. Um, Professor, uh, Commissioner Joshi mentioned earlier that drivers gave voice to a lot of Uber's platform early on when the city made efforts to try and rein in some of its practices. And I think that's a growing trend with direct-to-consumer products because Uber leveraged its identity as a technology company to accomplish regulatory arbitrage to say these regular rules don't apply to us it had this, and it had an app, it was able to leverage drivers as political constituents, and not just drivers, passengers too might get a map showing, a de Blasio version of a map, indicating that if Mayor de Blasio's rules came to pass a couple of years ago, that there would be literally no cars available on the map. That's a very effective political tool. You know, and, and I think in a lot of ways, there's been some regulatory forbearance, I think the word, where the rules might exist, but people may hesitate to implement them because they're going up against a very popular service. I think one of the reasons that the TLC can create the rules it has implemented now with greater societal support is because there's a growing reckoning, a tech clash even, uh, where the role, the sort of more insidious power of very popular technology companies and services are recognized as having very little restraints and very few responsibilities and fealty to users beyond providing a very great product. Um, and that's become a, a, a point of political dissent at the level of the federal government as well. And so that's a, just something, something to bear in mind. It, it's, it's hard to go up against a really popular service. Um, the other point I was going to make is that part of what makes the TLC's data collection policies so incredible is that often when we're talking about a black box of algorithmic accountability, 
Uh, we're talking about really small things like how much did you make? How much should you have made? Did you get the tip that the passenger inputted? You know, has Uber implemented a new pricing policy without telling you? Well, I think they did. <laughs> they, drivers had a contract where they would remit, let's say, 25%, but really more like 30% of what the passenger paid back to Uber as a commission. And before Uber actually changed the terms of its contract or explained anything otherwise to drivers, it started experimenting by charging some passengers more or even sometimes less than what the driver fare would be. And that is not so different from the kinds of experimental practices we experience as users of the internet where there's constant A-B testing. The headline you see for a news story might be different than someone else's. Facebook might perform an emotional contagion experiment, displaying sadder posts to some people and happier posts to others to test whether or not the bad feelings spread or the good feelings spread. Those kinds of experimental practices are part of what Uber has imported to the world of work. And part of what's so interesting about the TLC's pricing or pay standard is that by setting a minimum floor, it doesn't preclude companies from continuing to experiment and optimize as they see fit. It just says you have to be able to pay drivers effectively a minimum wage if you're going to do all of that. Um, I'd like to open up the panel to questions from anyone who might have questions. What questions do you have? Yes. Um, I want to first thank you. Sorry, I was late uh, for coming to the program. Um, great. I really appreciate um, your conversation, and I have lots of questions, but the main are two, right? Um, I wonder if you have data on who actually uses Uber, right, or all the share. You know, not that I'm poor, but I actually rarely use taxis, or um, I've actually never used except when I work with other people. Um, it's rather expensive. I don't think your 30%, 40% of residents in New York can actually afford it. So we had a colleague who previously studied these informal you know, gypsies and so on. You know, what about those? So the sort of the social justice aspect that, not just the work, I appreciate the part that you know, we talk about workers in a ways, but there's just so much space on the street, right? So we set aside bike lanes, and the buses, you know what I mean, people can, London, you know, buses take much more precedent because it carries more people per square feet. Uh, and so that comes within that sort of another aspect. How do you sort of um, work around the idea of sort of access to the street space? I, I don't know, I just sort of, I, I haven't done any research on it. So that's my first question. Second has to do with, I think, you know, the taxi commission has a lot of leverage in terms of, you know, let's say, you know, we put our foot down, we say taxis have to be the primary, there's a way for you to regulate how many taxis are going to get on the streets with Uber and all of that, it's a lot harder. So, how, what, what's your commission's role in coordinating with other agencies in New York, right? Like, what kind of leverage do you have? And I think our students would be kind of interested in knowing that. Sure. Um, this is some, I'm not sure every city has this, right? Um, and so just be interested in your thoughts. Um, so to your first question, I think you raised a lot of points and hopefully I'll capture them. Um, does everybody have the money to afford this? Um, I'll tell you, you know, my own personal feeling is there's a large number of people that take these services that don't have the money to afford it. Now that's not technically that they don't actually have the money, but is it work with their budget? Probably not. Um, I compare, and I have no numbers to back this up, but it, it, it is, it, to me it strikes me often as like the Starbucks problem, uh, especially uh, with younger people, they all of a sudden realize they can't afford a $8 coffee every morning because it's too expensive. Um, and this is compounded, I think, because you don't, you're not exchanging money. So you're putting it on your credit card and at the end of the month, okay, I'll pay the minimum on my credit card. You're not really understanding how much you just paid for transportation. Um, and I have scolded my own son for that very thing. Like, you know, you, you're gonna, 
you just worked for a week for Uber and Seamless. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, like, so, so I see it firsthand. So I do think there is, there's a honeymoon phase. Let's hope it doesn't last forever and that people do start doing a little bit more of self-budgeting. Um, but there is a very real danger that there's a generation of people that, that believe this is payment without really attaching it to the bottom line, which is that bill needs to be paid and there's interest on that credit card. And yes, you got from one month to the next, but at, on whose dime? On you know, MasterCard's dime. Um, I mean, on your dime that you gave to MasterCard. Anyway, um, so that's, I do, th I do think there is a problem with the, the number of people that are taking it and whether they can afford it. We don't have um, insight into who particularly is taking it, but we do know what areas they're being picked up on and we are now getting the prices. So we will soon be able to see of their price differentials among neighborhoods, which I think will be um, very insightful, um, whether there's any implicit discrimination, whether certain neighborhoods are being charged more than other neighborhoods. Um, your second question on how do you do this balance between sort of taxi and Uber and who controls the street and who gets the bike lane and the bus lane and the HOV lane, um, it really is a, a, a partnership between the Department of Transportation and the Taxi and Limousine Commission. But the primary mover there is the Department of Transportation. They make the decision on whether the HOV lane will let a taxi or an Uber in or not. They make the decision on whether there's going to be a taxi stand here or there's not going to be a taxi stand here or there's going to be a bike lane here or there's not going to be a bike lane here. Um, you know, we, we got recently the authority from council to come up with a regulatory scheme, which we have to do by August 2019, um, to regulate the number of Uber and Lyft cars coming onto the street, keeping in mind congestion. So how do you do that in a way that you minimize the empty vehicles in the congestion zone? And so I think that will, for the first time, give the agency, and we, we have to do that with Department of Transportation. So together we study the issue and together we come up with the regulations. And I think it's the right marriage um, because we can't, I'm gonna advocate for what drivers want the most, right? Because I have to look up for my constituency and DOT is gonna advocate for how to share street space. Now, as a person, I may agree with them, but as a TLC commissioner, I'm gonna stick with, you know, so it's the right marriage. You need a little bit of both. Um, and so this will be the first time that the city is, is the agency is able to exercise this level of control over um, the for hire market. Taxis, we've only ever able to exercise control through a series of state laws and some coordination with city council. The agency itself doesn't have control over the number of taxis. The city council can decide how many taxis are on the street. And if you want to sell them for more than the cost of a license, you need authority from the state to auction them. So there's always been a large political dance every time the number of taxis changes. And it has nothing to do with need, demand, or street space. It has probably more to do with 11th hour bargaining in Albany, to be honest. <laughs> I'd like to turn also to Professor Venke, who was also thinking about you know, how do we locate these issues outside of just one agency and within a larger conversation about regulation and the use of our streets? Yeah, I mean, this is not an easy, I mean, it's easy for me to throw it out as a, as a critique, but it is a difficult one. One of the things that came to mind, too, was on the positive side of the TLC is that it's, it can be fairly nimble in making policy uh, compared to Boston, where I was living, where the regulatory authority for regulating um, the app-based transportation companies came from the legislature. So if you want to change anything, you have to get the assembly to agree. And mm -hmm. even though it's completely controlled by Democrats, they can't agree on anything. Mm -hmm. um, so how are you going to change it? But, but I think that as we look at the data, we begin to find interesting things that I think poses larger questions. We're not just in the normative scope of transportation. I think that the nature of regulation, the nature of policymaking is constantly applying bandages and, and Massachusetts, I thought was interesting, where when they looked at it, uh, for the question that was just asked, they found that there was a higher than expected usage in poor communities in Boston. And, and they thought that was suspicious because why are there so many rides where people have less flexibility with their income to spend? And it's actually, and when they did surveys, it was completely because it became the mode of transportation of last resort. 
that you couldn't rely on a taxi to actually come. A taxi might be cheaper, mm -hmm. but you can't trust that's going to get there to you in time for you to get to work on time. The buses were lagging or whatever it is. So I think that when uh, my hope is, is that as we find these things, is particularly this conversation of what do we do when we look at the street is because there are challenges. And I think for New York, the unique opportunity to really think about congestion, congestion pricing, public transportation. I mean, everything for the unfortunate side is all coming together to actually have a comprehensive conversation of what surface level mobility and transportation looks like, let alone also considering pedestrians, bicyclists in this. I mean, literally a block from where I lived in Cambridge, another bicyclist just got hit you know, by a car, lost her life, unfortunately. New York, I think because of just madness here, doesn't has happen as often because no one can get around. Um, <laughs> positives and the negatives. But I think that there are opportunities. I think this is a golden opportunity to bring multiple people together to have this conversation. I mean, the fact that this conversation about congestion pricing, that money will go to the, the, the subways and buses, even if that doesn't happen at all, at least two parties or two different parts of transportation are, are, are now linked in a conversation. You know, that they roll off the tongue, you know, together. Even if nothing happens, at least we're having a conversation that we couldn't have unless there was a state of crisis. I mean, what's the old political say saying? Never, wait a, never waste a good crisis. But I think that there's a lot of things that are happening now that can actually bring these agencies together. And I mean, hope, one would hope that it wouldn't re you know, we wouldn't need these crises to talk about this. But it is a great way to actually have people in the same room. And I'm actually really excited to hear what happens you know, come summer with this conversation with the DOT and, and TLC. What other questions do you have, future policymakers of America? <laughs> <laughs> So we unsuccessfully fought for what might have been an incentive. But let me give you the sort of landscape first. Um, pooling in New York is difficult. I think New Yorkers generally don't want to share. Um, and we've tried through taxis over the years to you know, force some pooled rides, and they were all epic fails. Um, so when Uber and Lyft and these guys said, you know, we want to do pooling, they're allowed to do it under our rules as long as both parties agree. Um, and I, I, I was happy. Turn it over to them. We're really bad at trying to organize this ourselves. Um, and, and over time, it has become more and more popular. So in the beginning, it was woefully low. The actual number of matched was 5 10%. We're now up to about 30%. We get the data on actual shared rides. Um, I think we have, is it on Medium that we have a piece up that shows you know, shared rides over time and how it's grown? Um, but on our open data website, all that information's available. So it certainly has grown, and the f more and more people, it's true, that pick shared rides, the likelihood that you're going to share goes up. Um, one of the opportunities to incentivize it um, came with the um, congestion pricing, and if you don't put any of this on Twitter, <laughs> okay, I'm just telling you now. <laughs> Um, that there was a decision to give every shared ride a discount in the congestion zone. So uh, Ubers pay 275, taxis pay 250, and shared rides get 75 cents. And a question we had was, okay, but make it a real shared ride. You get 75 cents if it's a real shared ride, but if it's a sh request for a shared ride, it's not really shared. There's a great way to game that, mm -hmm. right? You just turn everything to shared rides and you know, save $2, pick a shared ride. And whether you link up with another passenger or not, um, you're going to get the pass. You're going to get the benefit. You're going to be able to pass that on to the drive, onto the customer. Um, but the decision in Albany was no. Let's make it for every trip. So I think that was an opportunity lost to incentivize them to really make sure that their algorithms work to share rides, not just to get more people in cars. 
Eric, I know you've been thinking a lot about And I how. consider commu yeah. commuter vans the original shared sure. ride. <laughs> <laughs> Between your work on dollar vans and your current concerns around how limiting driver growth through a cap or congestion pricing or a minimum wage for drivers um, will come together, could you maybe speak a bit to how those efforts will affect the city's larger mobility goals? Sure. Well, I, I want to respond to a point brought up by Professor Wu and then some of the discussion that's come up here um, first. So one, I too never do any of these services personally. If I'm in New York, I take I have an unlimited metro card or I walk. Um, but I will say I did take a shared ride with someone. They booked it for me the other night from... I recommend you all do this next year. There's a homeless count every year in late yeah. January. It was like four in the morning. I was with someone in my group and we were going sort of in the same direction. And so she got an Uber pool from, this is from uh, LaGuardia Community College in Long Island City down to the Lower East Side. And my fare was $4. So I take, I take yellow taxis. It's never that cheap. And I think sort of, I don't know, you guys probably experience this more than I do, like there is something crazy about the fares that are charged. This was before the most recent February 1st changes. Um, how long that those fares can continue to be that low, I don't know. That seems unsustainable. Uh, but the other piece, when I, again, looking through the PLC back book, the areas where the sharing happens tends to be farther out in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. East New York, Crown Heights, uh, neighborhoods where people do have lower incomes. And so maybe there's some gaming of that system that's going on. I don't quite know the answer to that, but I think sort of going more broadly is that this is all feedback on surface transport in general, right? Like people use these services because the buses and subways aren't satisfying their needs. Um, you, again, I, I look at dollar vans and I don't look at them as this is, well, I do look at them as being great and all that stuff, but I, that's not my point. The point is more that the bus is failing people along Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. If you look at bus speeds over time, they're dropping dramatically. Passenger ridership also dropping dramatically. Huge crisis in Brooklyn, in my opinion. Um, and these vans offer much more reliability and faster travel speeds. And that's what people opt for. And when you talk to them, that's what they tell you. Um, so I, I think that that's the big thing. The, the, the hope of congestion pricing or even dedicated bus lanes or whatever it is is that it brings more certainty and regularity to our, our transport network, and that way you can rely on it. Um, I mean, up here, I don't know how bad traffic actually is, but in other places at the peak period, if you wanna get to school, to work, to the hospital, to a medical appointment, whatever it is, if you have to bank in an extra half hour because the bus is just so unreliable, you're just not gonna take it. Whereas if you take a commuter van or a taxi or whatever it is, that unreliability drops to you know five, 10 minutes, and that's something that you can work much more with. And I think that's the real change and benefit of, of these types of services. They show sort of where public transport is faltering and failing. And I think the response is, okay, public transport, like do some push-ups, like get it together, mm -hmm. like perform better, not just sort of abandon it altogether. I would highlight that there's a cost to that kind of reliability for drivers. So although they're narrated as entrepreneurs and classified as independent contractors, they operate at a distinct informational asymmetry and disadvantage. They don't negotiate any of the pay rates, Uber and Lyft and the others set them unilaterally. They can negotiate for a lower fare, but not higher. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, And they have to bear the cost of that kind of thing. So one of the great boons Uber was promising early on was that it was going to resolve a long-standing issue of curbside discrimination. If you're a person of color, especially if you're a black man, a taxi cab might pass you by and pick up the nearest white passenger. And they said, well, we have a policy of blind passenger acceptance. The driver doesn't know where you're going before they accept the ride. And we measure their ride acceptance rates and we might fire them, deactivate them if their ride acceptance rate falls below, let's say 90%, or if the ride cancellation rate after they do know where you're going um, goes above 5%. So there were restrictions in place that helped to um, support these policies, but those same forms of management and rules also came into direct conflict with the idea that drivers are truly entrepreneurs who can make informed decisions. In scenarios like these, they're often 
like they might be forced to take unprofitable rides. Not exactly forced, you technically can cancel it, you can reject, but the threat of discipline and penalty exists within the system as well. And so it's good to locate the benefit of that reliability within a broader context of how the rules of employment become elastic <laughs> in order to accommodate this consumer benefit. I want to just make one quick comment on reliability because it's key to public transport. It's the reason why somebody might pick Uber and Lyft over public transport. And um, one thing I think about sometimes is where does the standard of reliability come from? And the more and more you have services like Amazon Prime, Fresh Direct, things that now I should get that in an hour, I should get that in a day, it changes the public's perception of what reliable means which means for like public transport, sometimes they're at a disadvantage because they're not <coughs> nimble enough to keep moving up. Um, and I don't have necessarily an answer to that, but what it does is create, it does seem to me to create uh, a, huge, a huge advocacy group for the companies because now you're without what you want in the time frame that you want it. And you didn't define that time frame. You didn't set out saying, I need this thing in an hour. But over time, you got used to getting it in an hour or five minutes or two minutes. And now it's your right to get it in an hour or two minutes. And it's very difficult now to walk back. And then we all, as consumers, become the advocates for the new standard set by the company. Um, and when you start to compare those services to something like public transport, it is a really hard hill for tra public transport to climb. Um, they certainly have to sort of break a lot of molds and start thinking like a business and these are their consumers and how do we make them just as happy as the Uber and Lyft passenger. Um, and without setting that as the benchmark, I think it's gonna be hard for many cities, especially New York City, to, to get, the, get the people back on public transport and get the support back for the bus system that's necessary. Um, I think the motivation is money. They're both going for IPOs. So where they can link you to a bike share service that they also make money off of, fine. And I could see them linking you to public transport if they've made an agreement with that public transport agency that there's some financial arrangement where it's beneficial for them. In the end, they're companies, so they have to do things that improve their bottom line. They're not, they're not as concerned for you to get to the place you want to go through many modes of transportation, even if some of them don't generate revenue for them. So they are ultimately going to look for what, what are the ways I can make sure that more aspects of your life, you're using my service, which can be beneficial because they're very good at it. So it just depends on your particular situation. To, to, to add to that, something that, that I think is a very interesting idea and I've, I've advocated for is I think cities in the 21st century, I'm gonna not use the right terminology here, but should all have a department of apps or whatever. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> for example, in New York City, yeah. you easily could have a municipal app where anyone who wanted to be a cab driver had to be on this app, right? If you wanted to also be on the Uber app, fine, but it would make the point of that sort of redundant, I would say. And so that these drivers who are licensing already directly with the city would also be licensing directly with the app. And so it would all be filtered through just this one app and not, you know, every Uber driver is also a Lyft driver is also a Juno, you know, it's, it would end all of the like 17 different screens and stickers or whatever. Um, so I think that that is something that the city, sh city should consider and look at in the future because the making of these apps from, as I understand it, is actually not very complicated. You know, I think in New York, as of last I checked, there were 74 licensed TNCs, or this was a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, um, all have the same app. The, the difference is maybe in the customer service or in stuff like that, which maybe cities aren't great at, don't get me wrong. But the, the point is that 
Um, you know, it isn't some secret sauce, at least I don't think, that is sort of the differentiator. Uh, as for why Uber and Lyft are sort of adding on, I completely agree with the commissioner, but I also think they're just trying to figure out their, a business model. And, you know, the thing that I find interesting about taking on bike share, for instance, is that with the taxi business, they don't own any property, they don't own the cabs, it, but with these bike shares, they're just buying tons of bikes and has sort of taken on a completely different model for like how they organize. And I don't think that they quite understand what they're doing or know, you know, they're just throwing stuff on the wall um, and, and seeing what sticks. And so I, I don't think trying to figure out what's coherent or logical is, is, um, is really gonna happen uh, by studying them. I think also with that too, the interesting thing with at least Uber is also Uber Eats. Right. That you also have to think that now, I mean, they're yeah. throwing things against the wall and they're delivering food. But it's also, uh, you know, as kind of society, a policy, at least in New York, does it make sense to send a car to bring your McDonald's, right? Because that's what it is. It's, util it's trying to utilize an asset to do more and make more money. But if you think of the emissions, the time, the infrastructure that's required to bring your McDonald's to you in 20 minutes or less or whatever their, their promise is. Does that make sense? It may in Atlanta, different you know, urban morphology, different traffic infrastructure, but as these companies are throwing things out, you know, they also raise flags because they do see themselves as a transportation company, not a logistics company, you know, in this case with the food. And now, at least regulatory-wise, they're a, a transportation company, but, you know, that also still falls in a weird, weird gray zone. If you only do Uber Eats, are you technically, you know, the same way? I think we have another question over here. Yeah, I, this is going to be a long with this question, but I'm sort of I'm curious about what you guys think the role of the consumer in all of this is. I've had conversations in the past about this particular issue where most people have said, well, why didn't the, the, the MTA or taxis come up with their own app to be a little more competitive with Uber and Lyft? Maybe people would just use that app to call the taxi rather than the list. And I know various things in the technology realm have, have attempted to do that. And you know, Google is the one that's supplying my public transport information and all these private private apps is, is how I get my information. And um, as you were speaking, I was talking about that. I was thinking about that Uber scandal um, that I, I Which one? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> the one that kicked it all off. <laughs> But I know immediately after I deleted my, I deactivated my Uber account. I think there was a slight dip, and, and it Lyft was really happy about this. Um, but I thought about that, and I was like, okay, well, this seems like one of the only things that's sort of slowing down or um, consumer knowledge or awareness about like emissions of like Ubers and Lyfts are congesting our streets and are causing more traffic and environmental emissions. So, is there an element that like we can consider the where we can? If cities didn't have the arcane procurement policies that they have in place, it's incredibly difficult for us to contract. Um, and it's incredibly hard for us to hire the kind of talent that Uber and Lyft can hire. We can't pay at those. We have no equity we can give you. Um, and we can't pay at the same levels. Um, so that has resulted in, um, at least at the TLC, we said let's let, let's let in, let's let et people develop their own apps and we'll put down the guidelines, which is, you know, it'd be great if there was one app. Um, the, the one problem that we found historically, like in the taxi technology space is, you know, there, there's two vendors now. Well, it's a duopoly and it's very hard to raise standards because the lobbying is, you know, incredible when you only have two. When you only have one, it becomes even harder. The city's held hostage to that one <coughs> vendor. Um, so allowing people to develop their own apps and giving them the freedom to do that helps us get over those. Um, we lose a little bit on uniformity and you don't have, you don't have, you can't say there's only one. Um, but we do allow taxi apps to, to work. There are two that are sort of more well known, Curb and Arrow. Um, and we recently changed the rules and allowed them to use GPS meters. They can actually do 
flat fares that are not based on the meters. And intentionally we did that so that they can get on things like Google and show the price up front to the passenger. Um, and when the passenger is looking at, should I walk, should I bike, should I take the subway, the bus, Uber, Lyft, or taxi can now be an option. Can I force those companies to do what they need to do to get on to the Google space? I can't force them to, um, but I've given them every tool that they need to do it and I've taken away every obstacle that was in their way to do it. Um, but there is a little problem between the amount of sort of venture capital that's behind a taxi app versus the venture capital that's behind an Uber or Lyft app. Um, on the consumer one, unless everyone's going to get a lot more patient and feel okay. I mean, I find like the Amazon thing is like yeah. symbolic. Yeah. I don't want Amazon here, but I sure want my book tomorrow. Like that same yeah. person is going to, you know, I don't know what the answer is. We're, we're good, some, you know, we have good thoughts sometimes and other times we don't, but all in the same person. From the consumer lens, I'd say that a growing awareness of how consumers can be misled or manipulated by these same systems that offer quite tangible immediate benefits is perhaps one stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. In a very simple or, or recent example, uh, Instacart had implemented, and it wasn't alone in this, a pay policy of using customer tips to substitute for the guaranteed earnings mm -hmm. that a shopper was to earn on each job, such as $10. So if a passenger tips 10 bucks, the company's off the hook for most of that pay. And tipping has a specific, if amorphous, Meaning it's supposed to be on top of your wage if you're especially an independent contractor. It's a bit different for tipped workers uh, who are employees, but no one is like, yes, let me tip my Instacart workers so that the company doesn't have to pay them. You know, and so there's moments where deception towards consumers becomes part of this outrage. I think a, a bit of that outrage also came out of the sexual harassment scandals and even beyond that, the larger political scandals of alliances that the companies were making or not making with the uh, Trump administration. There have been numerous points where the companies are expected to strategically ally and support causes that far supersede any specific transaction you're going to have to get you from A to B. They've promoted themselves as disruptive and as an exception to many of the rules and norms and cultural expectations we have for their operations by producing the sort of guise of offering something like a whole new world. <laughs> and that creates political responsibilities towards consumers as well who then have these expectations. Like I can't tell you how many people have come up to me with like a Lyft confessional because I wrote a book about Uber <laughs> saying, you know, I now I take Lyft and I'm like, well, that's fine for you. Uh, I know that Lyft also has very many of the same practices that Uber has had, but it's very clever in waiting until Uber has been embroiled by scandal and then like adopting that policy like right afterwards. Um, and in lots of ways, they actually have done substantively better jobs at creating trusted relationships with drivers. But the imprint that left on consumers is very, very strong and gives it a competitive advantage in many ways. Um, so suffice to say that I think a growing consumer awareness how they might be get, you know, getting higher prices <laughs> than, than their neighbor would be a moment of pause for many people who want to have fair and equal access to services. So if, if you can get a book in one day from Amazon, but Amazon decides that you know, the person over there actually has to wait for two weeks, you might find growing seeds of, of division. I thought it was so interesting when the commissioner mentioned that they're looking at price discrimination by neighborhood to see mm -hmm. if there truly are neighborhoods or groups of people who are paying more or paying less uh, for these services. That's interesting for a whole variety of reasons, but a lot of how Uber narrated its, its technology was that its algorithms were simply reflecting the conditions of the marketplace, were simply brilliant matchmakers between supply and demand. Of course, what the TLC has discovered is that it's often drivers who bear the cost of being oversupplied to meet that passenger demand. But beyond that, there's also you know, as Professor Rabenki was mentioning, like what's happening with surge pricing? Well, two people standing side by side might actually get a different surge denominator. Then, and that's a, one of those moments that gives people pause in how they trust or distrust large technology institutions. And the other piece, just real quick, we're, we're also going to get information on wait times. So when a passenger requests and when the car comes and we'll have that across the city. So we'll be able to see if people in certain neighborhoods are waiting longer than people in other neighborhoods, um, you know, and, you know, where those cars are coming from as well. So I think that'll be very interesting. 
I think it's 2.15, and so we have to wrap up the, the brunt of the panel, but I think some of us are available to stay for another 15 minutes of the conversation. I want to thank Min so much for organizing yes, thank this you. panel. Yes, <laughs> And thank you to all of our panelists for bringing your brilliant comments here today. Thank you for moderating yeah. from this very high. Yeah. <laughs>